Let's look at these announcements here. Homework 14 is due on Thursday. Then we're having a bonus quiz on Sunday the 15th. Now, that bonus quiz is something that is intended to help your quiz average. It can't hurt you. The way it's going to work is that it will be questions that are taken from the entire semester. And um, there's a, because of that, not anything specifically that I would suggest you do to prepare other than just um, hopefully you've been studying all along, right? Um, this, the grade you earn on this quiz can replace your lowest quiz grade. So for instance, if your lowest quiz grade is a zero because you slept in too late one day, then you can earn nine out of ten on this one and then that becomes the new replacement. But if you already have nine, nine, nine for your three quiz scores and then you earn seven on this quiz, then I would just ignore this quiz. I wouldn't lower your quiz average because of this one. What would you do? Well, because I'm not that generous. I think that uh, giving you any opportunity is probably more than I could justify if someone asked, why did you do that? What's the learning justification? I'd probably be on thin ice, but I think that this is a good compromise. What is the class that you're going to do? We're going to continue to meet in this classroom until, uh, until otherwise notified. I, I need to look one more time, but I don't think we're actually going to do anything more on Excel the rest of the semester. But if we do, then I'll send an announcement to let you know. So the whole semester, the whole course, Excel and not Excel. well, it's not going to be related to Excel because we'll have that uh, bonus quiz in this classroom. Ah, okay. Everything other than Excel. Yeah. Yes? Do we have Excel question exam? For the exam, we will not. The exam is going to be in this classroom, so you will not have an Excel question on the final exam. Um, you know, we've had Excel for both of the midterms and all three of the quizzes. So I feel like so far I've done a, I've assessed you a lot on Excel. And so the, the final exam will just be paper questions. Was it comprehensive? Yes, the, uh, the final exam is comprehensive. Um, in large part because it would be impossible to make it non-comprehensive. You know, the, the, co the topics are just sort of naturally cumulative over time. So. Um, comprehensive, yeah. Yes? Will we be asked to, to do Excel tasks on paper? So you're saying, like, what if I made a question that shows a grid of questions, uh, a grid and has you fill in the blank, something like that? No, what I'm asking is, for example, uh, incremental analysis for comparing mm -hmm. options and choosing the best one. I believe we've only done that on Excel, so would mm -hmm. you expect to do that? I see, I see. Um, so I, if I gave you a question that you've done before on Excel, and in a paper exam, I could say, here is a spreadsheet. You know, like I could print a spreadsheet. And I could say, calculate a couple of these boxes. By, but I wouldn't ask you to do the entire procedure from beginning to end by hand. But I, I could ask you, you know, a procedure that you're familiar doing by Excel, you know, everything that you do by Excel can be done by hand, but the reason why we usually use Excel is to do it over and over and over so many times is just time consuming and uh, maybe a little boring. But if I limit you to doing that just a couple of times on paper, then I think that uh, you know, that's something that would be, a, you know, you could do in a uh, paper exam environment. So I, I think what you're really getting at is what don't I have to study? You know, because we're not, because there isn't ex exam, because we're not doing Excel, what don't I have to study? And I, my suggestion is study everything. Study everything. Yeah. Any final questions before we move on? All right. So the whole idea behind chapter 15, where we are now, is finding ways to predict cost. And we've been looking at a really wide variety of methods to predicting cost, everything from cost indexes to uh, uh, tracking inflation over time. And we're going to continue on that trend today by looking at two more sections of chapter 15, the cost capacity equations and the factor method. And both of these ideas are very simple. But the nice thing is that we uh, conclude the semester where you've already finished your project and some of the last ideas are pretty simple so that uh, lightens the load for you. Let's look at cost estimating relationships using the cost capacity equation. All right, so the cost capacity equation 
um, acknowledges the idea that when you buy something that's big, it costs more than something that's small. So Q is talking about capacity. So uh, t think about a machine that is able to produce, you know, a couple times through the semester, I've used the, uh, the example of a case for a mobile phone. So a machine that can produce 100 per hour of these cases is going to cost less than a machine that produces 300 per hour. And so one of the ways that we can estimate costs is by using the ratio of the productivity of a machine or the ratio of the size of equipment. So for example, a passenger jet that holds 50 people compared to a passenger jet that, ca that carries 100 people. Now it's not as uh, simple as just saying you double the size, you double the price. And that's why there's an exponent here. This exponent says it's sometimes not linear, the relationship between size and price. And uh, so let's look at what this exponent can mean. First of all, if x is less than 1, that's called an economy of scale. And this phrase, economy of scale, if you've printed out the notes, you may want to highlight that. Now, this is one of the terminology uh, phrases that you maybe would need to explain in an exam. What it means is that you get a discount for buying something larger. Not that it actually costs less than the smaller item, but per seat or per capacity, the price is getting cheaper and cheaper. So if we were going to draw a curve that showed the capacity and price, so capacity on the horizontal axis and price on the vertical axis, this is what an economy of scale would look like. So an economy of scale where the curve is flattening out means that, of course, if you want to get a 200 passenger, a 200 seat passenger plane, of course it's going to cost more than a 100 seat passenger plane. But it's not double the price. It's less than double the price. And so the curve is flattening out. That's an economy of scale. Now, as you might expect, x is greater than 1. It's called a diseconomy of scale. Now, an example of a diseconomy of scale where it actually costs, you have accelerating costs, would be heard, I don't know from experience, but I've heard that when it comes to launching things into space, that to make it a little bit bigger costs a lot more money. You know, if you want to launch a satellite that is 200 kilograms, that's going to be a lot. No, I need to, I'm getting a warning here. All right. If you want to launch a, a satellite that's 200 kilograms, it's going to cost a lot more to launch than a satellite that's 100 kilograms. There's just something about the extra capacity that costs a lot more. Um, now, another example of that, I've been looking at reserving cars. Um, I've got some guests who are going to be visiting me here in the UAE. And if you want to reserve like a, a Nissan Tita, such good deals out there. It's so cheap to reserve like a small car. But if you want maybe a van, a minivan that can hold seven or eight people, the cost is four or five times as much. So you're better off getting two small cars instead of one large car. Just because there happens to be a diseconomy of scale. The larger size is more expensive. So the curve, instead of flattening out, it's getting progressively steeper. So that's when x is greater than 1. And when x equals 1, that's talking about a linear relationship. And so if you're 100 tons of coal, you're going to pay one price. And 200 tons of coal, they're not giving you any discount for buying a lot. It's just going to be double the price in some cases. So they call that the correlating exponent, the thing that relates whether you have a uh, an economy of scale or a diseconomy of scale. So here's an illustration. Let's take, for instance, a water treatment plant. And some of you, I think all of you, are eventually going to be taking uh, uh, 351. You've registered for your courses already, right? Environmental. environmental? Yeah. Anybody taking environmental in the fall? OK. So you're going to learn about water and wastewater treatment. One way of talking about the size of how big a wastewater treatment plant is or a water treatment plant is something that's called MGD, and that stands for million gallons per day. 
and that's how much it can process. And uh, although uh, these traditional units of gallons are only common in the United States, since a lot of treatment equipment is built in the United States and designed there, you still you have to know what MGD stands for, million gallons per day. So let's say that our uh, we have a known plant that is 0.5 MGD and we are uh, interested in a treatment plant that will do 2 MGD. We have the cost data, C1 is 1.7 million. And then the correlating exponent, X, is 0.14. So we can predict what the cost of the larger plant is going to be. This larger plant that's 2.0 MGD, what we'd simply do is we'd say C2 is, and now we have the first price, which was 1.7 million. The ratio of the two sizes, 2 to, one, uh, two to 0 0.5, and we take it to the power of 0 0.14. And when you do those calculations, I think I've already solved it here, it should be 3.55 million. So $3.55 million in this case. So this correlating exponent of 0.14, that means that since it's less than one, we get an economy of scale. That is uh, $1.7 million for a small plant and not too much more money. You know, you're roughly doubling it for four times the capacity four times the treatment capacity. Is there a question? I'm getting to be 2.06, which is going to be cheaper. Let's see. Let's double check these calculations. Can someone else verify? Two is the, uh, uh, two is the Q2, right? 2 MGD. And 0.5 is the uh, Q1. So it's four to the power of 0 0.14. 2.06? Okay, I guess I need to update these calculations. 2.06. Thank you for checking that. I'll have to double check my notes when I get back to my office. All right. Yes? Yeah, how do you know? How do you know about the correlation exponent? Good question. What you can do is here is a table from your book of typical correlation exponents for different type of equipment. And the way that they found this information out is um, you just call up vendors. You know, you would call maybe, for instance, a pump manufacturer and you'd say, how much is your small pump? How much is the medium pump, the large pump? And so the correlation exponent, what they would do is you would actually gather pricing data and then you would fit the curve to the pricing data and you'd find out what is the correlating exponent that causes the best fit to the, the data that you've gathered. And so here from our textbook is some information related to water and wastewater treatment plant. So for instance, it's showing a diseconomy of scale for some things where it becomes progressively more expensive to build those items and then in some cases you have the economy of scale. Uh, and there's a huge variety even. Uh, it's going from 1.35 for sludge drying, sludge drying beds. And you'll get a chance to see that when you're in 351. You take actually a field trip to the wastewater treatment plant that's just r right near campus. You probably have never noticed it before, but there's a big uh, treatment plant that's used to uh, process all the wastewater that comes from University City area. And it's just as you're driving on University City Road towards 311, it's on the left-hand side of the, uh, of the road, just after you've exited University City. So you'll get to see a sludge drying bed, for instance. Um, so let me hand you this uh, in-class exercise. I'm going to ask you to take a look at the uh, cost capacity equations and also combining it with the ideas of the um, cost index that we've done in the previous class. So this will be a review for the cost index and combining with the idea of cost capacity.
All right, let's look at this. Uh, let's look at the situation here. So the the pricing data that we got back in 2010, we know that things are going to be more expensive in the future. So the first thing we have to do is we have to account for inflation, and that's what the ratio of the values is doing. Uh, this construction cost estimate, it, it's like an index of uh, or an average of construction prices in 2010 compared to 2017. So that's I sub T and I naught. Uh, now the Q is going to be the capacity of each one of these items and so there's two complications. One is the difference in time and then the other is that we're building a bigger system this time. Previously, our system was small. We had a 2 MGD lagoon. Now we're doing a 5.5 MGD lagoon. Previously, we had a 2,000 uh, foot per minute blower. Now we have a 5,500 foot per minute blower, and so on. And then the other complicating factor is we have to look up the, uh, the x values off of this table that's found in the textbook. So we can get the exponents from here. So I was walking around. It seemed like everyone was uh, getting the prices and the cost's fine. The aerated lagoon, you see as we, we end up with a factor here. So the price in prices due to inflation is 1.197. That's the, the factor there. And then because it's larger, it's increasing the cost by a factor of about three. So that means the lagoon component will be 12 million. The blower component, 733,000. The pump component 291, and we can add it all together. So, any co any questions about how to uh, do these cost capacity equations? Then you might bring for us a question to, uh, for two components like this project and another project, and check which is better and take the this factor. So, you're you're asking if I would maybe come up with a certain type of question that does what? Making two projects. This project costs, for example, one, three, four, nine, zero. Uh huh. And other projects cost less than this project, and take that one. Okay. So projects. Yeah, you can combine ideas together. Definitely. Um, so you're asking about an, for an exam, though, right? Uh, that would be pretty complicated to have both the uh, cost capacity and then like a. Uh, like to integrate this with a cash flow diagram. I mean, anything's possible, but it seems like, in my mind, when you ask that question, it seems like that would make the question pretty long. So, I don't know. But in real life, you know, in real life, they definitely have to do this because you're going to have more than one person who is offering you a blower. You know, maybe you can have a certain blower that is more expensive and it lasts for 10 years and a cheaper blower that lasts for seven years. And so in real, like if you're thinking about how to apply the information you've learned in the course uh, in the real world after you graduate, then yeah, you'll have to combine cost capacity with time value of money and comparing alternatives. Maybe you'll integrate all of that with a benefit to cost ratio. So it'll, it'll get very complex in the real world. Okay, good. So uh, now you've had a taste of cost capacity. Let's talk about, talk about the factor method next. Um, the factor method is a way of uh, putting together a simplified estimate of cost, where you're saying that the overall cost of something can be predicted by the uh, cost of just one of its components. And let me give you an illustration before we jump into the, uh, the formula. Let me give you an illustration about um, what if you went to a restaurant. Now, if I told you that the cost of a meal can be estimated by, you multiply the price of water by 10. So if you go to a cafeteria and they're charging three dirhams for a bottle of water, then according to this approach, you could estimate just roughly that the meal will cost 30 dirhams. You know, the 10 to 1 factor. That, of course, you're buying other things than besides water, but you can get an idea if you're at a cheap restaurant or an expensive restaurant just by what they're charging for water. So if you walk into a restaurant and you're looking at the menu and they say that a bottle of water is costing you 20 dirhams, maybe you want to stand up and walk out, right? <laughs> because you probably don't want to spend 200 dirhams for a meal. Maybe not yet. 
Maybe, maybe you'd rather save your money for other things. Uh, but that's the, the main idea behind the factor method. It doesn't only apply to, to meals. It's just the idea that you can estimate the price of a, uh, of a building by how much concrete is going to be used. And the building is more than concrete. It also includes reinforcing steel. It includes the electrical systems, the uh, water systems, uh, heating and cooling. But if you have an idea of one thing, then you can extrapolate the entire cost based on everything else. So let's look at this formula. The formula is saying that the total cost can be estimated by a cost factor, H, and so here I was saying H is 10. That idea that the cost of the meal is about 10 times the price of water. And then C sub E is the cost of a major component of whatever it is you're predicting. Um, so we can take this approach and also include the indirect costs. Remember when we were talking about uh, direct costs and indirect costs, the, uh, the indirect costs are the things that we have to recover where it's difficult to say exactly how much of that service goes into the product that we're selling. And so the indirect costs are the expenses having to do with accounting, uh, supervisory services, it may be the, uh, the electricity or the rent. It's just the things where it's tough to say exactly how much of it goes into the certain item. And so what we do instead is calculate just a percentage. And so the, uh, the news article I showed you is that the indirect cost recovery rate at AUS was going up to 42%. So that uh, if you spend 100 dirhams on equipment, you have to give the university 42 dirhams to pay them for the rent, utilities, and all the other services that are provided. So what this formula is doing is it's showing you how to account for indirect costs when you want to find the cost of the project as a whole and you have the major equipment that needs to, you need to pay indirect costs on the major equipment and then you need to also pay the indirect costs on the uh, uh, well, this is called showing you that the direct cost factor, what, what fraction of the costs are the direct costs. And presumably, if you know the price of a major equipment, C sub E, that's going to be something that you can estimate directly. And then the indirect costs are added on top of the overall costs. So uh, on the back side of the paper, next to uh, after the X factors, I've got part two of the in-class exercise where we are looking at the a diesel generator. You know what the delivered cost is going to be of the diesel generator. You know the cost of the concrete pad, the cost factor for training, and the indirect costs. What I'd like you to do is apply all of those cost factors and the price of one item that you know here into this equation. So the sum of the direct cost factors multiplied by the one item that you know the price for, and then you put the indirect costs on the outside of that. Did everybody get 1.9 million? Yes. So let's, let's talk about what that means. Um, in this case, we're trying to predict the cost of a whole project by only gathering one piece of data to begin with. The one thing that we limit on is the generator. But our past experience has told us that the concrete pad is about 39% of the generator. So if you have a small generator, then you use a small concrete pad. If you have a large generator, you know, if it's heavier, you need a thicker concrete pad and so on. But roughly speaking, just our experience has told us that usually the concrete pad is 39% of the generator, and then the operator training is 16%. The larger the generator, the more training is required. Our indirect cost factor is just the, uh, the amount we have to pay for human resources, 
and uh, maybe the organization who gets our environmental compliance permits and so on, that's 27%. So you can see how the substitutions have been made. In the end, it's uh, 1.9 million dirhams for the whole project. And so if you think about you know, like how can these ideas be combined, you could do a factor method along with cost indexes. We did cost indexes here with cost capacity, but it could have been that we had our pricing data from the past, and so we were trying to compound the prices forward into the future. All right, well, before I let you go, let's take one last look at the announcements here. Just make sure we're on the same page. Your next homework assignment is due on Thursday, and then a week from today, we'll have that bonus quiz here in the classroom. Any questions? All right, have a great day. I'll see you next time. Thank you.